I would like thank you for coming to Houston Oasis. We are a secular alternative to faith-based community. My name is Jacob. I will be your MC. I'm not any happier about it than you are. <laughs> um, I would like to point our core values over here. Uh, the one I'm liking today is meaning comes from making a difference. We have a really good program lined up. We have Brightwire, and then our featured speaker is fellow AC and Laura Spector. Our featured speaker is Laura Spector. She is an artist and has an exhibition coming up at the Jung Center from November 9th to December 2nd. The exhibition and this talk is titled Drawing from the Wound Collective Whole. A reception will be given on November 12th, 5 to 7 p.m. So without further ado, here's Laura Spector. Thank you, hi. Thanks for being here, thanks for having me. I hope I technologically sound okay. Yeah, okay, good. I sound very loud to myself. I have a lot of buttons to push today, so we'll see how this goes. Okay, all right. Um, I've been here before. Uh, previously, I was here with a collaborator, and then I came by myself, and I taught a little drawing class. And today, I am going to be telling you about a new exhibition that I have coming up at the Jung Center. Um, if you're not familiar with the Jung Center, it's in Montrose. It's right next to the Museum of Fine Art in Houston. The exhibit is free. It's up for a month. And it is a group show. And you can see this is our invitation. You'll notice there's a QR code on the invitation. And that's something very unique and special because of the pandemic and because of going to visit galleries and seeing people on their phones constantly, I thought, why not make this accessible for everyone? So the idea is asked if you want, and you can bring your phone with you and pull it out. You're expected to pull it out, scan the QR codes at each of the artworks, and listen to the art while you're looking at it. So it's an audio-visual show that was um, created specifically for technology and the pandemic, kind of. Um, this project started four, four years ago. And in 2017, my uh, collaboration dissolved after 25 years. And I lost my best friend in this because he was my best friend. And we just were not working together very well anymore. And it was um, my passage into grief. And I've got my little notes up here, by the way, because I'm going to be talking about a lot of stuff that's a little bit, ooh, and I haven't talked to many people. This is the first time I'm presenting in front of a live group since 2019. <laughs> so it's like, oh, wow, you've got legs. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I had my first anxiety attack in a movie theater, and this was shortly after the separation of my collaboration. And for everybody who I've ever talked to who have experienced one of these, I was at a, I was at a birthday party in a movie theater watching a movie, and for an hour and 29 minutes, I was gulping air, not knowing what was going on with me and thinking I was going to die. I didn't know what was happening. And then I went to the dessert portion of this party, um, and I had to sit across from a total stranger just trying to smile as I thought I was dying. And then I went home and happy story. I called uh, a friend of mine who was a student. I teach adults, by the way, um, and she's a therapist. And I told her, I said, I need help. I don't know what's going on with me, but I just, I'm at that point. And so she turned me on to a really excellent therapist um, and that helped tremendously. At that time, I thought, oh, I'm never going to be able to make art again, because how am I gonna make art after making this type of art with my collaborator? It took both of us and it took 25 years to make this type of artwork together and to be on that same team and to know how to finish each other's sentences. And it was devastating. So I thought, well, my career is over, my peers will judge me. The art world won't take me seriously anymore. And I had just gotten up to the point of sculptural paintings, 
where I was taking paintings from museum storage facilities and that or or artworks that had been stolen and reinterpreting them into paintings. And um, I was kind of at the apex of my career at this point. So there was a lot of museum shows, there was a lot of competitions that I was getting, grants, and all of it came to a slamming halt. So I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I decided after two years, I did not paint. I did not make art for two years. This was kind of crossing over. This was 2017, so 18, 19. Then I started painting just kind of- uh, We're gonna pick. So where was I? Let's see. So two years, I did not make any art. I made nothing. I made like demos for my classes. I tried to paint, I tried to draw, but what I was doing during that time was going to a lot of writing classes because I found writing was a hobby and I couldn't fail at a hobby because who cares, you know? And um, I didn't take it seriously. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed being around other people who didn't know me. They didn't know my history. Um, it, it was just a really, it was a safe haven. And I started going from class to class and um, my husband, Bradley, who you know is a musician, um, is a great editor. So I would come home and he'd be really supportive and he'd help edit my pieces and I'd go in and, you know, to my classes and be really excited to read those. So I thought for a brief moment, I think I'm going to become a professional writer. I think I'm just going to leave visual art all together. And then I was like, well, maybe not, because that's kind of the dream that I had when I lived in Thailand of becoming like a kayak tour guide. <laughs> like, wait, what am I doing? So I decided, okay, I need to get back on, um, on the wagon and start making art again. So I came up with this idea that I needed a collaboration. And I thought, well, I don't wanna do this alone. I'm gonna bring in a group of friends um, a group of other artists in Houston. And I had been really bad about making friends. I'm a little bit of an introvert. And so I reached out to some people that I knew and said, I'm making this project. I want you to come in and meet with me. And during that time I had heard, I don't know if you know, Mark Marin. he was in town last night. I didn't see him, but he's a comedian and he has a podcast called WTF. And it's probably the most popular podcast in existence. And he interviews, it's an interview format. He's kind of like, a, a version of Terry Gross, I guess, on NPR. And he interviews everyone. So I heard him interview Brene Brown and she talked a lot about the call to courage and about um, really putting yourself out there and vulner being vulnerable. And I thought, well, this is something that I'm not very good at doing, but maybe I can try because what do I have left to lose aside from you know, my career, which I kind of thought I lost anyway. Um, and then I heard an interview with him with Eve Ensler. And Eve Ensler, you might know her more so from her creation of the Vagina Monologues. And she wrote a book called The Apology. And he was interviewing her about this book. And The Apology was a book that she wrote after her father passed away on behalf of her father to her. She wrote The Apology she wanted to hear from him. And he was extraordinarily abusive to her. So it was a very moving interview. It's a very moving book. And it got me wondering, how do we craft apologies? And I don't mean like just bumping into someone and going, oh, sorry, you know, or getting in a fight with a sibling, you know, when you're a kid and you're being told to say you're sorry. But how do you truly apologize to somebody? And what does that look like in a culture where people really don't wanna take responsibility for their actions unless they're called out publicly. And I realized that's really a strong point of vulnerability. It really, it kind of hurts to say you're sorry to someone, whether you love them or whether you realize that you did something very wrong and that it was destructive to other people um, and what that means. And then of course, the third topic was healing, which is a journey that I think I will forever be on. And I was thinking about the idea of healing on a communal level versus a personal level. And I've been in situations before, like I was in Thailand during the tsunami. Um, I lived in New York City when 9-11 uh, happened and I watched the towers fall. I watched a plane go into a building, but I didn't feel alone during those times of grief. 
Instead, I felt like I was around community. We were all mourning together. People in New York were on heightened alert and we had posters up and we'd walk around those really quiet, creepy streets at night, just wandering aimlessly, but we weren't alone. And in Thailand, no one's ever alone <clears throat> because their culture isn't set up that way. It's a community. Everyone has each other's back. There's always someone there for you. So those types of grief were very different from what I was experiencing. And I got this group together who didn't know each other. Our artwork had nothing to do with one another's work. I mean, it couldn't be more different if we tried. And the group evolved. At first it had like seven people and then one person dropped out. We had, or no, we had eight people. Then one person dropped out, we had seven, then we had six. And it just kept kind of moving. Um, and then, November um, in 2019, I was at work and I got a call from my mom's doctor and she told, and he told me that she, the dialysis wasn't working anymore and they were going to have to take her off of dialysis and she essentially had six weeks to live. And I was like, okay, why are you calling me? He wasn't calling my dad or any of my siblings and I'm the youngest. So I felt, oh, wow, this is really intense. And my parents lived in North Carolina at the time. So over the next couple of weeks, I would be co told by a therapist and friends, you need to go see her. Cause I was kind of like, well, there's nothing I can do. And I talked to her on the phone. She's like, there's nothing you can do. Don't worry about it. But they were like, no, you have to go see her. And so I did. And what I felt aside from intense grief and sorrow was at one moment it hit me, you know, a lot of people talk about gratitude and they're like, be thankful, be thankful. And I, there are certain key phrases like relax or you shouldn't be so stressed out or be thankful that I have a really hard time understanding what those are supposed to mean. And I feel like I play those roles or I pretend to play those roles. But there was something that struck me while I was sitting at the edge of my mom's bed that just opened and consumed my entire being. And it was that of gratitude and it hit me. And I understood it in that moment and the most horrific moment that I had experienced watching my mom, you take her last breaths and all these nurses coming in and out and the quiet of the room, because when there's nothing they can do for someone, there's no beeping in the room, you know, it's just quiet. And this gratitude washed over me and I was like, okay, so I wanted to talk to my fellow artists about this. And I wanted to share this with them when I got back. So now I have a new perspective on grief. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse than a 25 year dissolution of my collaboration, my mom dies. And then I'm taking care of my dad from another state. And then the pandemic happens and we're in lockdown. And then I have a hysterectomy. And then a week later, my dad dies. And then a week after that, I'm watching my dad's funeral on my living room table in Houston while he's being buried in St. Louis. It was so much. It was so much. So I was like, okay, I just need to put this into art. I need to move forward with this. And mind you, I found this great meme yesterday. I love memes. I found this great meme. And I'm going to read this because I, I, I got it yesterday. I sent it to my um, therapist and she was like, yeah, uh, it's called stress laxing. I've never heard of that before. So stress laxing is a verb. It means being stressed that relaxing makes you more stressed because you're not working on what's making you stressed. <laughs> and that is, that's my mirror. Okay. So I was like, I got to get back and start working. So my new art peers and art friends, a couple of them students at the time, I brought them over to my studio. This was before the pandemic started, by the way, we shoved our tables together and we have a writing instructor that I had taken a class from previously. And he's coming in to try and get us to open up and really dig down deep to discuss ideas of grief, apology and healing and what that means. And it's really hard to get a group of adults to really dig down and be honest with each other. These are conversations that are very taboo. We're told to, they're dirty laundry, keep your laundry to yourself. 
we're culturally just not equipped to deal with these things, but yet they have to be dealt with. I feel like we're at this apex, this point in time where we're just tearing apart from each other and crumbling. It feels like it's such an important time to be talking about these things. And so I thought, well, if artists can't talk about it, who can? So we got closer and closer to the truth of these ideas. And here we are working in the studio and hashing it out. We would write our stories. They were ideal was they were flash nonfiction, which means that they're 800 words or fewer. They're short, very short pieces. <clears throat> and we'd share them together. And then I wrangled Bradley, Bradley White, my husband over there, and he got involved and he decided together, we decided we need to read these or have them performed. And he was the main line into the performance, the performers of Houston. And I was like, can you get these people to record our writing? Because if it comes from us, I don't know, art, you know, not everyone can perform. So I asked him if he could get these people to perform our works and they did. I'm going to share a couple of those with you. This is how we met up during the pandemic. And I just want to say it's not easy at all to get an art, to, to, to create artwork and wait for the exhibition over four years. It's extraordinary. It's such a long period of time, but we did. Um, we moved forward with it. This was a piece that I drew of my mom. Um, she, this was after I had visited her. And when I got back, this was the last vision that I had of her. And I drew this in charcoal and liquid charcoal and Conte crayon. And I put in a picture of myself and I dressed the same. So could <laughs> match me up to my picture. Um, and this, so you can get an idea of the scale. We decided all of these pieces need to be monumental. These pieces the size and scale of the emotions that go behind these pieces are so important that we wanted them to be large, not to be missed. This was a preparatory drawing. So I wanted to put in an example of how I'm transferring it into paint onto a canvas. So I've got tracing paper over, <clears throat> this is my art teacher coming out. I've got tracing paper over the drawing and I'm tracing it out to then place it onto canvas. So I started working on multiple canvases at the same time. I had three topics, three canvases. So the second one um, I've started that blue paint is my underpainting or my sketch. So you could see I've got both canvases going at the same time. This is a close up. So one of the reasons, one of the things that we all agreed on is that we would start our paintings by inscribing our stories onto the canvas before we began painting, kind of as a ritual or an incantation or a way to follow our words. So you can see the writing and on any of these given works, which there's 18 in the show by six artists, um, some of the words show, some of them are obscured, some of them are completely gone, but they're all there. This is starting the oil painting process. This is Peggy Stoip. She's going to be in the show. And this is her writing on her canvas and painting in. This is Ellie Orsek working on her canvas. And she's measuring out. There was a lot of research because it's hard to figure out the visuals to go with the writing. So you've got this writing. It's a very personal story. A bunch of people have heard it and edited it. And then you have to come up with visuals that go with it, but you also don't want it to be trite. So figuring out how to manipulate the visuals to make them their own story. This is Pat McHenry, and she is flipping a gigantic piece of watercolor paper. It's huge. So she paints on watercolor paper and watercolors, obviously. And this is just a giant, I mean, I feel like I wanna go see this show just to see a piece of paper that big. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and she has like, th she's got three works in the show, obviously. This is the group of us pre-pandemic. I'd love to get together and recreate this photo. I'm sure we all look so different. And then this is the oil painting of my mom <clears throat> with the text in it. And then this is a piece based on apology and it's called The Spectacular. And the text goes up into the rays over the head. 
And the scale of this is, it's quite large. I think it's like five and a half feet. Okay, so this is gonna be the invitation. This is the invitation for this weekend, but I wanna share with you a few things that I've learned about this problem, well, a couple things I learned about this process. And I'm just gonna read them as I wrote them last night because I thought I, I really wanna get it right. Okay, so the first thing, you cannot cry to death. No matter how often or how much you cry, you might get thirsty, hurt your throat, swell your eyes, scare people around you, but you won't physically die from crying. That was a really big thing to learn. <laughs> and making anything is hard. It's so hard. It's even more difficult to keep people involved over a four year period of time, but not only is it challenging to make the work, and by work, I mean art, music, theater, performance art, street art, poetry, dance, whatever it is. It's so challenging, but for those working without a budget, even more so. And so I just wanna say here's to all the makers out there, those who helped our project forge into a reality and those we've never met who simply continued to create culture because they must. It's so important and I think one thing that I really want to, aside from the conversation of grief, apology, and healing, which I hope that people will come away from the show and maybe even this presentation, talking about what those things mean and how they affect them and how they wish they can communicate them. Um, I hope that they come out of this realizing that all of the art that we see, whether it's on social media or Instagram, or we have kids that do it or friends that do it, we understand that nobody has to do it. It's not, it's not something that must be done. It's not like going to pay a bill or getting groceries or making a meal. These are things that we're called to do. We feel like we have to do them. We have to express ourselves. And it comes back to this Carl Jung, I'm gonna paraphrase that Carl Jung, since I'm gonna be showing at the Jung Center, his idea of loneliness. And this is paraphrasing. Loneliness doesn't come from not having people around, but instead it's from being unable to communicate the things that are important. And I think that's why artists of all types make what we make, because we have this need to communicate. Uh, we have to say these things and we wanna be around beauty and our version of beauty. And there's always an audience for every version of beauty. Okay, so I just wanna share that with you. This is the invitation for the Jung Center. And you are all invited. The opening reception is on the 12th, which is next Saturday from five to 7 p.m. Okay, and then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a couple of pieces with you. So let me see if I can figure this out. All right, so this is the first one. It's called Matchsticks. It's read by Anonymous, and you'll probably, you might recognize the voice, um, but this is my piece on apology. Firecrackers shoot out of our mouths. Words build M80s, then rocket launchers. Excaliburs radiate into arcs, hitting the ceiling and scattering ashes to the ground. Sparks crescendo for a crowd of two. Our spectacular fight slowly dwindles into sparklers, then tears. Silence is followed by more tears. Snot. Just as the performance starts winding down, one of us lets out a bang snap, surprising and scaring both of us. Fireworks sparkle again until a bit of rain forces us to take shelter. More silence. Soft, ambiguous apologies. I love you. I love you too. Chests hurt where hearts live. And we leave the scene of this reoccurring crime. This is not our journey, but a pit stop we sometimes frequent. A decade ago, you were on one side of the world, and I was on the other. 
pen pals, advice columnists, jokesters, and makers. We built a world through MySpace until after months of emails, a phone call finally ensued. You should visit. It's not like we have to make babies or anything. Those two sentences began years of adventures and not making babies together. We traveled, we rented, painting and making music wherever we slept. We'd get off track with plans, then wriggle free. Sometimes we failed miserably at our artistic passions, then lend each other a hand to stand up again with dignity. Every so often, a firework display bangs from our faces, illuminating and sucking away the air between our bodies. Fights help remind us that I'm not your mom and you're not my dad. But we constantly forget small details. Behind closed doors, we compare emotional scar tissue. The stiffened skin is subtle with pink, jagged lines, not quite smooth and not quite right. Sometimes what we thought was a faded scar is really a scab in disguise. I pick yours, you pick mine. The distant popping of fireworks slowly rumble throughout the apartment, the car, the grocery store, the city, the state, the planet. It's time for a tantalizing match to strike into a blaze. Red mechanical energy converts into white heat, sucking the oxygen from our lungs, and we release an encore performance for each other with wild abandon. After our last sparkling display, I unzipped my chest. I cracked apart my ribcage and found my heart. I struck a match against the bleeding wound. The flame blazed a warm light. A list of offenders were faintly carved into the beating muscle, like jagged letters cut into a tree with a pocket knife. Some were crossed out then cut again. I read the layers of hurt, names and wrongdoings, and your name wasn't there. We've always been different. Our explosions are filled with truth and eventual healing. I often forget I'm safe with you, and sometimes a fiery display feels good. When I peer deeper into my cavity, I hear a repeating beat. It isn't the crack, pop, whirring of fireworks. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. It is my beat. The rhythmic sound I hear is infinite and includes the apartment, the car, the grocery store, the city, the state, the planet, and you. The rhythm of a heartbeat has no interest in who is right or wrong. When we find our beats, instead of our bangs, we heal faster and have less need for blazing displays. Here, take my matchbox. I can't say that I won't need to borrow it someday. I can't promise I won't find another box of red-tipped pieces of wood sold along a highway and some big cats to explode during my weakest moments. For now, I'll turn off the lights. In the darkness that can be so frightening, let's find the rhythm of our heartbeats together. So that's apology. And I actually wrote that as an apology after a fight and I gave it to Bradley. And then I told them I was gonna be recording it for my piece. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, now, pull up the minimalist. So I wrote this piece in one sitting. Uh, well, that, that would be inaccurate actually. 
the main core of this story, uh, after I visited my mom and I was on the airplane taking off and I realized the hardest part of that entire journey was hearing the wheels of the airplane tuck up into the plane itself because I realized I'm never seeing my mom again and flew back home. And I think it was the next day uh, I had the apartment to myself and I just sat at a table with scrap paper and just wrote this and it just by hand wrote it all out. And then over the course of a couple of years, a bunch of people helped me edit it, starting with Bradley and then a couple of art teachers and then many students within cl art writing classes. So it was crafted and workshopped. So it has seen many variations, but the core of it stayed accurate throughout. So anyway, I will share this with you. After the funeral, there was still more work to do. There was always a pen to put away or a towel to fold, which seemed like ideal reasons to not paint or walk in fresh air. There were always emails to write, jobs to apply for, and laundry to wash. The list of things filling up her time and space seemed endless. After the death of her mother, she had even less time to herself as condolence cards that needed to be answered were piling up. There were always papers to be stacked. The Ikea kitchen table was a prime location to sort, pre-file, and file stray papers. It was her favorite piece of furniture on which she served many meals. That table collected junk mail, credit card offers, pens without lids, and puzzle pieces like a magnet. Each object was carefully inspected before being relocated to what seemed like a better, more precise location, eventually reaching the garbage can. Her repetitive work schedule often left her feeling empty, but after watching her mother's burial, she felt alone and invisible. In a powerful gesture, using the length of her arm, she swept all of the assorted contents from the top of the table to the floor. Papers, unopened mail, a cat brush, and puzzle pieces scattered to the ground. She collapsed the kitchen table. It had two wings and six drawers that folded down to form a perfect rectangle, eight inches wide by 26 inches long. That felt a little bit better. She could breathe easier with the extra space. The hinges on the table squeaked as she moved it in front of a white cabinet with open shelving. By moving the one piece of furniture, a chain reaction began. She shoved all the furniture against the walls. Space felt good. The apartment was built for families who had to quickly relocate to work on the mission to the moon. No thought went into these one-bedroom spaces as they were slapped together purely for function. The space was suffocating and dark, despite the one large square window facing the parking lot that didn't open. She wrapped her arms around the sofa as she lifted it up on top of the faux granite kitchen countertop. Stacking furniture gave her more space. She lifted the Ikea table on top of the open shelves. She stacked the room for over an hour without breaking a sweat. Now all of the furniture was stacked against the walls, piling toward the ceiling. She took a step back. If she swept, she could imagine doing yoga, reading a book, or maybe meditating in this space. She felt both biceps, just like she had done every evening after swimming her timed miles at the gym. She gathered her thoughts. What would happen if I could break everything into smaller pieces? She wanted control. She started with the folded kitchen table. Her stride picked up pace the closer she got to the blonde colored wood. Like a WWE wrestler, her arms wrapped around the tabletop. Almost effortlessly, the table folded in half. Splinters cracked open, but nothing flew away because the material was particle board. She folded the tabletop and the legs again and again into tiny pieces, smaller than a forever stamp. 
She towered over all of the wooden postage stamps laying on the floor and felt more powerful. She scooped them up with splintered fingers and ate them. She began folding everything, breaking objects still not paid off on her credit cards into smaller pieces, breaking the laws of physics. She found a pencil trying to roll away and broke it in half and shoved it into her mouth, swallowing hard. It was even possible to eat larger objects whole. The room became more and more barren by the second. She moved at a manic pace, eating every surface. She ate every drinking glass hidden from her husband, the husband who insisted on a new glass every time he wanted a swig of almond milk, the husband who left all those barely touched glasses scattered throughout the apartment. She chewed the glasses with a crunchy satisfaction. All that was left were the walls and the floor. Where were the cats? Did they escape out the door? Did she eat them? Did she eat them? She had a vague memory of peeking outside to survey the neighbors. No one was watching. There was no meowing. She hoped for the best. Next, she yanked the walls toward her feet. The foundation of the home rattled, releasing a soulful gurgle. Dust filled the air. She had worried the walls would be harder to break up, but the first one folded like a greeting card. With ease, she clawed down more walls with her bruised fingers, then noticed her ring fingernail was hanging from the quick. She paused, seeing the blood, but felt only numbness. A shadow from a tree spread across the length of the floor. She noted this wholly new view of nature. The wall across from her crushed to the ground in a thud as half the ceiling collapsed. The ceiling surface had always disgusted her. Its popcorn texture was likely sprayed on by some hapless workman. She ate it all the same, then picked out a few bumps that the ceiling left in her teeth folding and eating until it was all gone. The floor was now covered in drywall dust and smudge marks. She had just cleaned it the day before. She yanked up the corner of the flooring, rolled it back and forth between the web of her thumb and her elbow. She stomped up and down on the coil until the wooden floor became sawdust. On her knees, hovering over the mound of wooden snow, using both hands, she grabbed piles of sawdust, tossing handfuls into her open jaws, coughing and swallowing, gasping for air when she could get the chance. She licked her fingers to grab the last crumbs that surrounded her. There was nothing left to do. The computer was gone. There were no more emails to send, grants to write, or jobs to apply for. There was nothing left to fix or clean. She looked down at her hand and wondered what her thumb would taste like. That's the minimalist. So... <laughs> That is, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the show will be like to be able to wander through it, put earbuds in. Every artist is completely different. They're as different as that initial work that I showed you. So um, if you come, be prepared that you're going to be in for a really amazing show that is just spans so many different ideas and concepts and experiences. Um, thank you so much. And I can answer questions. <laughs> oh, it was so wonderful. It's so you. amazing. <laughs> thank you. I remember Adley, I remember you. I don't remember anything of this kind of stuff that you shared with us those many years ago. I, I already have my invitation for your show, so I was going to come anyway. And I recognized your name, and another one of your another one of your participants. Okay, my question for you is: 
is everybody taking the material that they had already assembled four years ago and just bringing that or have they continued to live their lives and add to their experiences in putting those things into the show because the person I know has had some ser a serious experience since since then. I'm just curious what to expect. Okay, that's a great question. So the uh, the question being, um, are we all, are all of the artists using the original material and bringing it forward are, or have they altered the material as it's developing for the show? Because in four years, a lot of things happen, including the pandemic. Um, several of the artists, probably all of the artists have gone through major life events. I think someone had s massive surgery, somebody's father passed away. Um, there's all kinds, there's other surgeries. There's all kinds of stuff happening. Um, to my knowledge, some of the work has been updated. I don't know if it reflects those specific things, but I think it has affected not necessarily the writing, but the visuals. I do know that the visuals have altered significantly in some cases. Some of the visuals were put to the side for a length of time and weren't created until more recently. I think some of the visuals were probably recently finished as, as soon as like four weeks ago. So there's been some significant changes visually, but the stories remain steadfast. Thanks for that question. That's a good question. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> it, it, it's it's not a question. It, it's a comment. Your 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 comments about about the pandemic, and and all the writing and oh my gosh, I, so many wonderful things have shown up on Facebook. My Facebook, not not everybody's Facebook, but I love my Facebook so many poems and so much ah, wonderful thinking just it's just been so i'm i'm very grateful grateful and i'm grateful to you too for yeah thank, thank, you. thank you yeah absolutely i've found so many new artists and so many new poets um bradley uh edited a video together and uh and for uh, brian bilston one of his poems yeah, and I think it's called America is a Gun. America is a Gun. Is it? Yeah. And, and, you know, and it goes through all these things that the different countries are for, but then the repeating stanza is that America is a gun. And um, there's, so that's a poem that makes its way around. And then um, there's a musician named Jill Silbule, who was popular in the, very popular in the early nineties. And she, she was popular for a song called I Kissed a Girl, which isn't the same as the Katy Perry song, but it was another one. Anyway, she put music to it. And then I took that and then I remixed that and then I made a video for it that that gets circulated now. So it was sort of like these collaborations that have happened over time. And Brian Bilston's is another one of those poets that writes about, you know. Yeah, and he has fantastic things. poems online all the time on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, yeah. that was kind of a tangent, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. With the Astro shirt, <laughs> Ghost Rose. Um, I think you mentioned when you guys were all doing the writing pieces that would build the visual pieces, you would edit each other's work or kind of help out. So how do you do that in a thoughtful way while still being sensitive to people's stories? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really excellent question. <laughs> that's really hard. Uh, it's easier for some of us than others because I had been coming out of a collaborative space for so long. My feeling is I just want you to edit it down. To me, writing is, I feel like it's like 20% writing and 80% editing. And I, I personally like my pieces to be like slashed and burned, you know, and then I just take the ashes and try and build up from there. Um, other people are really sensitive. Every word counts. Like if you remove an is or a the, you're, in, you know, you gotta <laughs> you have a really good reason. So that's why I brought in this writing instructor as well, because he he has a knack for doing it. He's also a published writer. 
um, Michael Carson's his name. He's on KPFT right now. He's got a, an hour long show on there. Um, and he's really sensitive, you know, he's very quiet, spoke, very quiet spoken person, but then he also served a couple of tours in like Iraq or Afghanistan. So like, he's got some life experience behind him and he was the sensitive person. So essentially if I felt, cause I was kind of like leading kind of this thing. And if I found that someone wasn't really connecting to their work very well or being truthful enough, I would write to Michael and be like, do you think that you could maybe, you know, one of those things? And then he would go in and kind of do that. But we all sh printed out our work, shared it with each other, and then we could make notes. So the idea mainly to critique other people's work was to let them know when something wasn't clear, when you had confusion about something. So that way it's not making it an emotional issue, but it's making it more of like, I don't understand why this is happening when this other thing would be happening. And that was like, an, that's a, probably the best description of how to critique someone else's writing without them having a meltdown. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much for having me. All right, so we're going to have one final song from Brightwire, but as they're getting ready, um, we have a brief announcement from Richard, our treasurer. Don't worry, this will be mercifully brief. Uh, don't forget there's a black hat in the back. We do pay our musicians. We pay rent. Uh, we also are gradually saving up money to maybe someday buy a building. Um, and uh, so if you have an opportunity, drop a little something in there. Uh, or you can do it by various electronic methods. If you're unable to, uh, that's fine also, because we're happy just having you here. Thank you. Just laughed, leaned in with a smile. You know I don't belong to anyone, boy, but I think I could be happy here. Why? Yeah, I know we both broke in, but we still wish from falling apart. Best place to stop. Yeah, I think you'd be the best place to stop. Love the words she spoke today left me at a loss. Trying to break down all these roads we've been shown. Falling apart. Maybe matching up all these crackages will mend all our broken hearts. Yeah, let's mend all these broken hearts. Like to hide in our shell Skew the pain and say that we're alone The only way we're gonna heal these wounds Is to be brave and let the damage show Yeah, let's be brave and let the damage show Yeah, I know we're all broken, but we're still with from falling apart. 
Now the lead that all these crackages they make us exactly who we are. Yeah, they make us exactly. 